All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome back to Learning Impact 2021. This is our first general session of the second day, Tuesday. I'm glad you were able to tune in. We were just talking with the panelists here, and you know, everybody's so busy and with a virtual event. Sometimes it can be difficult to uh, to keep the other work going and tune in, but everything is being recorded. So I hope you can take advantage of the recordings as well. We've had some great sessions already in just the first day and the morning so far. So this is our uh, panel for uh, session on open standards as an executive call to action. Uh, so we're here to talk about open standards uh, basically as a key strategy, right, for school districts and suppliers. And then if it's a key strategy, what's the appropriate involvement and or leadership from executives? In other words, sometimes people think, well, standards are something that just the technical people worry about or they just use or what have you. But if it's a strategy, and maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but if it is, what's the role of executive leadership? So we've got a kind of a dream panel uh, here uh, for this, uh, for this uh, uh, great folks that really uh, know pretty much everything there is to know about this topic, I think, uh, um, although it is an evolving one. So I'd like to introduce our panelists and I'll go one by one and we'll say hello. So our first panelist is Emily Bell, who's the Chief Information Officer at Fulton County Schools. Hi, Emily. Good morning, everyone. Glad to be here. All right, it's great to have you. Uh, Dan Gull, who's the Chief Academic Officer at Broward County Schools. Hi, Dan. Good morning, Rob. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to IMS Global for having us today. Our pleasure. Uh, David Keene, who's the Senior Vice President of Product Management for D2L. Hi, David. Greetings, everybody. I'm uh, pleased we can have this chat. It's an important chat. All right. Thank you, David. And last but not least, we have Melissa Lobel, who's the Chief Customer Experience Officer at Instructure. Hello, Melissa. Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Okay. Well, um, we're going to be talking a little bit here uh, in this session uh, about something called Standards First. If you want to sort of check that out, it's at imsglobal.org slash standards first, one word all spelled out. Um, but we're not going to get to that probably right off the start. We're just going to be talking about some more general things. And when we get to that, I might fill in a little more detail for, for you, for those of you that aren't aware of uh, exactly what Standards First is. So first question should be an easy one for our group. It's really, you know, who benefits from open standards and, and, and what do open standards enable for those particular beneficiaries? What are your opinions on that? Anybody want to go first on that? Rob, I'll go first. So Thanks, Dan. thank you again for having us. So as the chief academic officer, my job is to make sure that we maximize time for students and teachers to be able to interact in ways that result in learning. So achievement is a result of engagement and engagement's a result of attendance. They gotta be together, they gotta have good stuff to do, and then they have to be able to have feedback loops in order to do it. And in order to do that, we supply the teacher student community with a variety of resources and training in order to enable professional judgment to happen. If not done coherently, what ends up happening is that people try to figure out how to use the tools they've been given rather than using the tools they've been given. And as we reverse engineer for maximizing teacher-student interaction and them to work together, we've got to make sure that the coherence is baked in from the point of procurement forward. Mm -hmm. And in trying this a lot of different ways, what I have come to the belief is that we need open public agreements about how things are to work together nicely so the technologies, be they paper or digital, fade into the background so that people can develop the habits in order to maximize that teaching and learning. Security, interoperability, and analytics are all the things that I, as an executive, are worried about. Those are based on good student-teacher interaction times. And open standards is what enables all of that to occur. And it's you know people like Emily who are making sure that the information systems that the educators are using are working. It's David and Melissa who are 
letting us know what those tool sets are. So colleagues, what do you think? Mm -hmm. I, personally, Dan, I'm so happy to be on this panel with you because as a chief information officer, it warms my heart to see a chief academic officer and hear him talk about security, interoperability. I mean, those are usually the words that maybe some academic departments would say, oh, that's you. That's the chief information officer, that's IT. But really it is a strategy that involves both of us, academics and IT. Um, I have certainly seen um, in my career, uh, last 27 years, uh, when academics comes forward with a solution that they believe will move students to achievement and mastery, but the technical capabilities of that tool are lackluster at best. I've got an example going on right now in my district. I'm at Fulton County Schools in the heart of Atlanta, Georgia, where we have about 90 plus thousand students in our district. So we're, we're very large. I am very fortunate to have a data warehouse team. It's a small team, but it's a team that runs a, a dimensional database. We run tabular models. I have highly expertise people in there. And then I have a, an interface team, uh, basically some folks who are just there to make sure that when we purchase tools that we're able to get those um, integrated quickly. Mm -hmm. If the tools that academics is purchasing are interoperable, if they are, they meet the IMS standards and they're certified, then my data warehouse team doesn't need to engage in high levels. That is easy plug and play. So to Rob's point earlier, you don't really have to be highly technical when you are leveraging the standards. Mm -hmm. And that's what levels the playing field. A lot of districts are not fortunate enough to have a data warehouse, highly skilled individuals in that space. They only have folks who are able to plug and play and those people wear 20 other hats. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I am, I am a champion for the um, IMS global certification process so that vendors and districts are speaking that one roster language. We're working with a national assessment right now. It's a great assessment. It's doing really great things to reveal where our students are in terms of mastery. They're not IMS certified they don't, they're not one roster compliant. I cannot tell you what a struggle it is in a district our size to make that work. A lot of manual manipulation. And in my career, I've been in smaller districts. So I've, I've been on the front end of manipulating data fields manually and uploading those manually every night. We should not be there in this day and time. Our students deserve plug and play, getting ready to get um, time with that tool so that they can get to Sanders Mastery. Okay, so, so thank you, Emily, and thank you, Dan. So Dan, Dan introduces co this concept of coherence, which to me is a, sounds like a great word to describe what we're, we're trying to achieve. And, and Emily brought forth this idea that hey, this, this idea of open standards actually potentially benefits smaller school districts um, more than it benefits larger districts, which is an interesting, interesting idea. I, I feel that's personally true as well, but, it's, but we're sort of, we've got, of course, two larger school districts on the line here right now who are trying to make this happen for the good of all. So, okay, suppliers, Melissa, David. Who, yeah. who you guys would like to weigh in on who uh, who benefits from open standards and and what benefits do they get? I I I'll jump in. Um, I think Dan and Emily's comments around 
this ability to move the technology out of the way. Mm -hmm. So we're focused on, on learning. And I think um, underlying that, particularly for vendors, is time management. So not only are we giving back time to um, district leaders, to district technology specialists, so they can focus on the teaching and learning piece, but we're also giving back time to vendors so that we can innovate more quickly. So if we're not having to go in and build integrations and custom integrations to support what our districts and our customers need with hundreds and hundreds of other technologies, and they're out there, <laughs> there are a lot of technologies out there in K-12, we're able to then focus on adhering to the standards, creating our standards compliance, and then moving forward with innovation and bringing even more tools to the table that enable that student learning piece and that and driving the outcomes that, that our customers are looking for. So I think that's the real benefit to the vendors to then in turn directly benefit students and teachers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so many people have said so many amazing things. It's it's hard to it's hard to follow um, uh, the all stars. But uh, in my misspent youth, I was a teacher, and um, I brought the web into the classroom, and I was fascinated by how um, the web could the web and technology could democratize access to education. I was teaching in a very small a town in the northernmost tip of Alaska, 3,000 people in, in Barrow High School. And it occurred to me that um, access to information technology um, in a fair and equal fashion was a big difference maker for, for, for kids who are learning. Um, the transition for me was when I started to talk to other classrooms around the country and I ran a little project um, where we connected five classrooms, one in Atlanta, one in Riverside, California, our classroom, and a couple other Native communities, a Crow community and a Navajo community. And the difficulty we had understanding how systems could talk. And so this led me down a path of, of my goodness, shouldn't things talk together? This is the web, isn't it? And um, what both Dan and Emily talked about was that whether you're a small school or small school district, you know, whether you're Fulton, Broward, NYC, DOE, Gwinnett, or, or West Bridgeford, uh, interoperability allows technology to fade into the background and helps teachers reach every learner because technology is a kind of superpower for teachers. And so there's this question of who should care about interoperability? Well, kind of everyone kind of everyone, even teachers sh should kind of care because it might be a delightful end user or delight delightful learner experience, but if there's no way to connect the experiences and the things from that student, let's say the grades it produces or the, or the interaction evidence it produces, there's no way to connect the student's learning into the broader cohesion, to use Dan words, Dan's words, we're stuck. And now we've created friction and now we've created slowdown and um, what we really are interested in is, is people thinking about interoperability as, as rather than not me, but yes, me. And the benefits they're going to get are, are pretty powerful. Um, uh, that's, I think, all I have to say about that. All right. Well, thank you, panelists. That was a, we're off to a good start there. We talked about <coughs> coherence. We talked about the complexity of the ecosystem and how open standards make it make it easier. And um, that benefit flows directly down with the teachers and the students. So, and, and as far as I'm aware, uh, most uh, education leaders are, are uh, care a lot about what the teachers <laughs> are experiencing. So our, our next, and I'll just mention to those tuning in that if you'd like to uh, send me a question for the panel, We've uh, got the session chat that's available on the page where you're tuning into this session. And I can monitor that. And if I see a good question, I'll, uh, depending on time and so forth, I'll, I'll, I'll try to get that in. Okay, so our next question is, and Emily hit on this briefly with her comment. It's about this kind of, is this an IT subject or is this an academic leadership subject? In, ter in terms of leadership, is this, you know, is it even a leadership topic, right? But I mean, I think all of you think it is, but it, but is it an IT? Is it, it might be just a softball question, like, should sort of sounds like, 
should be all of the above. But what's the re what's the reality on the ground? The reality on the ground is we know there are certain perceptions about you know open standards and oh that's sort of technical stuff. The technical people worry about the standards, and so that's sort of for them to figure out. And we can't let those get in our way of you know. What do you guys what 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 do you guys think about that? And do you see do you see I see in the IMS community it certainly seems the the involvement of the academic community definitely seems to be becoming greater. Um, and I'd say in our K-12 school districts, it's probably pretty close to 50-50. And in some of them, it's the leadership is directly coming from the curriculum side of the institution. But what are you seeing? You'd like to take that one. So I'll opine, and then I'll ask uh, some, one of our providers to do it, because when we procure one of their tools, we're outlining through the standards what they have to play nice with. And then once we procure it, Emily's got to implement it. So let's talk for a second about other constraints that education executive leaders need to do. There's legal constraints. And even though we're not lawyers, we need to be well-versed in what the legal constraints are. We have accounting and auditing familiarity that there are behavioral and implementation standards we need to comply with. We are not trained accountants, yet we must be aware of it. We are experts in the educational accountability systems, which are state education agencies under Every Student Succeeds and others do. Here in the 21st century, and it's important to realize that we're more than a fifth of the way through this already, it is absolutely necessary that education executives be as conversant in the standards for implementation of technology as they are in these other domains of law, fiscal accountability, and uh, educational accountability. If we're gonna talk about doing something with dollars to produce an educational outcome, you know, the loose term of return on investment, the ROI has friction in it if we do not have easy implementations. And mm -hmm. standards are a way of reducing that implementation friction. It is absolutely necessary that it be articulated upfront. And I go back to the procurement mechanisms. Our RFPs, RFIs, and other documents that tell our communities, both the practitioners and the potential vendors, this is what we expect to have happen, needs to occur. And as we begin making the pledge, as we build the pledge into the uh, procurement documents, it puts a constraint on our vendor partners who are no longer able to just do their best and breed proprietary solutions. In short, they gotta play nice with others. So David, Melissa, <laughs> I'm setting you up so that Emily can talk about how it goes. Yeah, the transparency associated with learning standards where parents, for example, say, I really want to understand what my, my children are learning. And they can go to a standard and say, oh, I understand what the standards are. That level of understanding is, I think, what we think about technology standards. And this is, I'm always kind of that outlier of like, why should teachers care? Why should parents care? Why should students care? But outside of that, they actually should care that there's a learning standard and a technology standard because those things are now so interwoven in the experience. And that kind of clarity um, uh, should be available to all. And one of the cool things about the pledge, of course, is that it hyper-focuses on not only open standards and frictionlessness, but visibility and transparency. So everyone can understand when, why don't we just use tool A or why don't we do B? And, but when, well, from a technology perspective, that system won't share your child's information with the school district in a, in a way that's seamless, like, oh, that's not good. Let's encourage them to do so. And this sort of fluidity of, an appropriate fluidity of, of uh, um, information that systems need to do in order to educate children is important. That's, that's my two cents. Thanks, David. Uh, if, if I can um, just uh, add to that, our ecosystems are, are webs of connected tools. And um, for a very, very long time, and we're only seeing this on the vendor side more recently, but for a very long time, 
when we would when a when a district would go procure a tool, it would be about the relationship between the district and the single vendor. And so you'll see in RFPs clear, you know, clear, clear documentation around what's expected of that single vendor. But for a long time in RFPs, or even just in the overall procurement process, there weren't questions or there weren't expectations around how do you play with others. And I still think there's a gap there. I think mm -hmm. um, districts that understand this uh, are moving forward with having as many expectations around what does that web look like as um, what does my relationship with that vendor look like. But that's only a recent thing. And I think we have work to do there. And the thing I love about the pledge is by declaring the pledge, you aren't just saying, I expect you to work with me in a particular way, but I expect you to play well with everyone else in a very particular way. And I loved that that Dan mentioned implementation, and I'm going to take that one step further. By having all players, academic and technology players at the table during that implementation, so we've already set the stage of what's expected of us as vendors. By having all the players at implementation, we're able to not only move through that implementation more quickly, but address problems more effectively where there may be gaps um, in how we potentially are meeting those expectations. But having to broker that in the background while trying to make sure there's an effective implementation can really slow down the process or even block um, more immediate success or block capacity in that ROI. And then I would like to extend that to implementation into adoption. We as vendors need to help um, our districts, which is experience. We're working with hundreds of customers, thousands of customers. If we don't have all of those players at the table, we can't do that as well um, because the dialogue isn't full and rich. And again, by having these separate dialogues, you're not having that impact in a timely fashion or in a complete fashion uh, as expected at the outset. What I love about that, um, Melissa, is that IMS is at the heart of that conversation, meaning that we don't have to invent it every time. It can be a place where, just like the pledge says, the certifications are explicit, the testing of the interoperability is explicit. And so the seamlessness can become apparent when that web is brought together. And so in some ways, the, um, oh, this is technical, it's not me. IMS in some ways removes the complexity from that conversation mm -hmm. and makes it a simpler conversation. Uh, are you IMS certified? Can you confirm it? Have it? Has it been tested? Yes, that feels good to me. <laughs> it can sort of simplify this, this connectivity. You know, if I could um, just bring this particular question home, because I, I think originally it was, is this IT or is this academics? I want to bring you all into my world yesterday in an executive leadership meeting, superintendent, all of the chiefs, and we're discussing um, issues at hand. The chief academic officer brings forward this issue that I spoke up about earlier. We have a national assessment company, not one roster compliant. And what the chief academic officer said is, it is taking us more time than usual. It's taking IT more time than usual. He may not understand all the details involved in that, but he knew that we were taking more time and that's not normal given the fact that most of our vendors now are IMS roster, uh, one roster um, compliant. And so he says to me in this meeting, Emily, can you provide more details? That's the kind of cooperation that um, the standards are able to give us now. And so I, you know, I said to the superintendent, yes, we're working with this company. We're actually, uh, we reached out to IMS Global to help us make sure that they get on board with the standard so that it is more efficient and we have better turnaround time to get that tool turned on. So it's definitely not just IT, it's academics and IT, and of course, our vendor partners. Rob, if I can just add something before we go on to the next question on this one. So, you know, we've talked about interoperability and Emily just did that so well. And, David Bliss and all the other providers can really focus on security, including FERPA and HIPAA and everything else, if we've got a common language in order to do these 
this data architecture, data dictionary kind of exchanges. That then enables analytics, right? But I don't wanna treat this as a technology issue to Emily's point. In some ways, this is best understood as a logistics supply chain issue where, you know, if you think about those big container ships that are carrying standard size cargo compartments that then enable docks to take them and move them onto trucks and trains and everything else, that's what we do with student data. And you've got to have common definitions of what your ship sizes, cargo boxes, trains and trucks are. That's what the open standards are enabling us to do. We can move insights, we can move resources, we can customize down to the individual IEP, individual education plan for a special education student or tier one instruction for every kid. We can scope and scale if we've got a framework to do it. The open standards provide a common logistics language to do education. Great. Right, so, yeah, great analogy. And I, I'd, say, I'd say thank you all for those uh, comments. And I think in a way we've probably answered our next question already, which is about the, you know, why is it important to have executive leadership? And I think, I think it's really been answered because the, the point is, is that this is, a, this is about coherence for the students. This is about um, improving your supply chain. This is, this is about moving to a methodology that's not a continuous series of one offs, you know? one off integrations, one off with, you know, which might've made sense when we had 10 applications or five applications, but when we have 500, right? <laughs> it does, it no longer makes sense. So we've already started talking about the pledge. So I thought what I would do briefly just for the audience, um, giving them the URL, but I thought the, uh, I thought what I do just very, very briefly is um, uh, uh, talk a little bit more about the pledge, because sometimes the reason I think it's appropriate is not only are we going to uh, follow up a little bit more here on that, but but you know sometimes when we talk, right? You know, I'm more aware of this than anybody else because I came to this job, you know, from the real world, you know, of being a supplier in ed tech and being supplier in other sectors as well. Sometimes the standard sounds like a lot of happy talk. To be honest, I mean, it, it really does. I mean, it's a it really kind of, and we have all seen examples of standards that haven't really actually resulted in plug and play necessarily in terms of what we're trying to seek. And so what I wanted to talk about the pledge, the pledge sounds kind of ethereal, but it's actually not. It's at, the whole point of the pledge and the whole point of the standards first program is to really run to ground what the issues are and make sure that we're getting standards in practice and that the standards are working in practice. You see, there's a gap between the time an organization uh, supplier organization gets their product certified by IMS in a standalone testing harness to what then actually happens when that product, that, that's a very important first step. And in Emily's case, she doesn't even have that yet. <laughs> but, but, but then there's a gap between that and then what actually happens in the real school district when you're dealing with real data and you're dealing with three or four parties that all think they're implementing one roster exactly the same way or the right way but there are nuances in the standard that allow, that really force them to, to ne not necessarily do that. So the point of the pledge and the standards first pledge and the standards first program is really just an honest way to get people on the same page, you know, and the pledge is the pledge is just a commitment. And it's not just even IMS standards, it's any open standards, right? And it's basically an agreement to be open, transparent, and to work cooperatively. Um, in some ways, in my mind, you know, we've had 120 plus organizations sign the pledge so far, which is very, very good. It's almost kind of a litmus test because there really isn't anything very onerous about the pledge. We, we understand that some organizations, you know, it will be perceived as a legal thing. It's not. It's just a serious promise. Well, we understand that in some organizations, there's this type of reticence that we're some of which we're talking about here, which is that, OK, you know, I believe in this because I'm the IT director, but, but can I really sign this for my entire organization because I'm not sure that they want me to be um, adhering to this when in fact, I, it may mean that I'm slower in a particular situation with a particular vendor, just as Emily laid out there. So, so uh, the, the pledge is just this very simple idea, make a commitment, make a commitment and make it publicly. And then we can count on you. You don't have to be an IMS member 
to take the pledge, right? Anybody can take the pledge. It's not about IMS standards, it's about any open standards, right? And so, so we think it's really important, but then the last piece I'll add is that the standards first program also includes a whole bunch of cool tools, right? So the so compatibility check is the is the name of the tool. So compatibility check includes the trusted apps dashboard as well. But it's really all about how do you do testing of actual products as they're deployed in the school district, and how do we make sure that all those products are doing the same thing, with the primary focus today on one roster, because that is for K twelve kind of the seminal how you get to digital on day one, and that's the, and that's the one where there's always been the most tweaking in the past between what's happening between this, the SIS, the school district data and the various downstream entities. So the great news is this is the real world, right? We're in the real world, this is the real world. And, and we can see that the suppliers and school districts are really catching onto this now. You know, At first it seemed like an extra step, but now it's getting clear that if we really want to collaborate going forward, we really have to, we really do have to run down and see where we are. It also brings to light situations where there, there are needed improvements to a standard, for instance, right? So that's very, very important. So, so the next question for the panel is really about this idea of the pledge. You've already, some of you have already mentioned it. You know, what aspects, why is the pledge important? What aspects of the pledge do you feel are perhaps most important and why? Well, if I could um, really quickly piggyback on something you just said. One of the parts of the pledge is talk, it points to giving feedback on deficiencies in yeah. the standard. So I love the standards. You know, I've been talking about how I'm frustrated with a company that doesn't meet that one roster standard, but I have another scenario going on where the standard doesn't get to the granularity that I need. So pulling in Dan's metaphor of a shipping container the, the traditional boxes don't, size of the containers don't necessarily fit where I want and need to go, especially when it um, pertains to grade sinking between um, an SIS and a, and, a, and a third party application. So the fact that in, in this platform, through the pledge, we can all come together and talk about those deficiencies and build a better mousetrap together mm -hmm. on the same page is one of the things I really like about the pledge. I, I wanna run highlighter over everything Emily just said. Like, <laughs> yes, check plus, plus, plus. Um, right now, one roster isn't yet uh, the standard that enables true frictionless, easy plug and play with every vendor, um, uh, particularly around Grace Pass Fact. But we want, that's where we wanted to go. And so this opportunity to put the pledge and put that um, uh, uh, standard into your RFIs and RFPs is, uh, we couldn't recommend that more strongly because of all the benefits to parents, to students, to teachers, to admins, to, to um, IT. Like everybody benefits when that becomes part of the fundamental conversation on standards and RFIs and RFPs. Um, the pledge itself, my favorite clause is the exact one that Emily called out, which was once you get that standard in practice, if there's a deficiency, the, the, the pledge uses the word deficiency, go work it, go fix it, go repair it, go amend it, go revise it, get it working. Uh, one of the beauties of IMS is it's not about, um, what term did you use, Rob? I don't know, happy, happy words or something like <laughs> happy, happy talk. Happy, happy talk. <laughs> this is where like, yes, me, I care if everybody's using standards because it affects me. And IMS has shown that it puts the standards into practice. Um, and so I love that. Thank you, Emily. And if I can, if I can please ask to, to capitalize on that, don't leave it up to your vendors. In so many situations, I see, I'm gonna go sign the pledge as a district, and, and it's not in this case, which is incredible. It's what I, I so love about Dan and Emily, but, but I see folks sign the pledge and say, well, okay, I've said this is important to me. Vendors go figure this out. But that's not how we find the gaps that, that Emily is talking about. It may work for vendors perfectly fine, but it is a significant deficiency in how it's addressing 
a current or future academic need or, or technology need for the district. So everyone needs to be vocal in these conversations. Everyone needs to bring to the table, not only the deficiencies or how we can continue to improve the standards, but everybody needs to participate in the, the broader dialogue around why, why the standards and, and, and what new standards may not even be iterating on the existing ones. There may be opportunities for new standards. But again, if you leave it just up to the vendors, we're not going to always satisfy, despite our best attempts at doing it, we're not always going to see what we need to be doing in, in, in a meaningful way to, to impact the student experience. So Melissa, I want to build off what you just said about how the pledge and its components fit together to not only solve many of the problems that are today's problems, but to really set us up for moving forward in education and to catalyze possibilities. So one roster with its focus on the student at the center is going to allow us to individualize, personalize, and make sure that things happen. Common Cartridge really makes sure that our resources are able to be mapped well to the individual students. And then all of that has to take place with security, right? And that's our trusted apps seal. So those three pieces fit together. But new standards, and Rob, I wanna highlight the comprehensive learner record standard, the CLR standard that IMS Global has been working on, is really going to enable us to replace the report card, the transcript, and what it is students get out of a K-12 system because it allows for the documentation of competencies at the granular level so that students have a record that can be stored on blockchain or other things for a verifiable credential that they're able to carry with them from K-12 education. And the new horizons of machine learning and artificial intelligence all require some degree of data structures to be coherent without having to spend incredible computational time to harmonize structured and unstructured data. If we're going to solve tomorrow's pr problems, we've got to take care of making sure that we structure things well today. It's like saying, well, we don't need a Dewey Decimal System. All the books are in the building, and that's what we call a library. That just doesn't work. And so, you know, while we may go to a library of Congress instead of the Dewey Decimal System coding, we don't, as long as we've got a way to structure and understand things, we're going to be able to, one, better serve the need of each student, and at the same time, address the systemic needs of how we allocate resources to help all students. Well, those are great comments panel. And uh, I feel like maybe I should say it's a couple of words is, is uh, almost like a participant here as well as the moderator in a way because, because uh, I couldn't agree more either with the comments and the sen sentiments. You know, I think, I think if, if there are folks in the audience who might be puzzled by this because they might be saying, well, well, don't we have standards, don't we have processes and procedures in the standards organization to improve the standards? Aren't we always completely together and so forth? That's the part that 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 is not the real world because the because the, the problem is is that the culture is very one much one of we define a standard supplier implements a standard standard goes to market and then supplier has to go off and do some other stuff and then they come back later right to try to figure things out but the question is how do you get the feedback into the standards community right both from both the institutional perspective and also from the supplier perspective. And again, the whole point about the standards first is to deal with the reality is that it's hard to get that feedback. It's hard to get that feedback, right? We, we can have lots and lots and lots of meetings with lots and lots of very, very intelligent people. Um, and uh, But specifically, we may still not see what has already been sort of band-aided over in the district, right? That actually pre prevents us from actually getting everybody on the same page in the future. Because once you fix something in the short term, which has to happen, right? You can't necessarily wait every time for everybody to completely agree. So you're, you're gonna have to make a compromise, right? The point is that compromise has to come back into the standards organization so we can decide and figure out where to go from here including new areas that it's opening up, like the extension of an existing standard or even a completely new standard like comprehensive learner record. So we've got a couple of areas we still wanna to get to and we've only got six minutes left. So, um, you know, and maybe, I'll, maybe I'll, just, I'll just state the question 
two questions together just so you can pick whichever one you feel like you'd most prefer to talk about. Uh, but Melissa mentioned earlier um, that, you know, this is kind of a cultural thing. It's kind of a new thing, this idea of integrating lots of stuff together, getting the sort of coherence Dan mentioned. It's kind of a new thing, relatively speaking, right? So, so one of the questions is just how far have we really come? You know, are we in the second inning? Are we in the first inning? Are we in the eighth inning? You know, there's nine innings in the baseball game. And the second, the second question, and why? And the second question or question could mix into this is without naming the names of any organizations, do you see any practices or policies among suppliers or institutions that might be hindering adoption or the effective implementation of open standards that you would like to just mention, because if you mention them, that'll help us address them. Either one, who wants to take it? I'll just close with, um, I, I don't even know if I'm gonna answer one of those questions, to be honest, so that's, <laughs> so, so, but, but um, uh, Dan <laughs> talked about personalized learning of personalization. One of the interesting, paradoxes about standards-based technology is that we have 51, close to 51 million K-12 students in the United States alone. We don't need 51 or 52 million different technology systems. But 51 million students probably have 51 million different ways of learning and growing and developing over the course of their lives. So one of the cool things about technology standards, it, it, it gives that scalable possibility to so many tools that can be connected to help every single one of those students have a personalized journey through their education to accomplish what we call learning standards or, or academic outcomes. Um, so the, I think I'm kind of answering your first question, but um, what excites me about this conversation is the, is the tapestry where mm -hmm. there are some organizations both on the supplier side and on the school district side that haven't yet identified the benefit and sometimes get in their own way, um, treating student information as a, um, a something within a silo that has a transactional cost to, to share with others. And we're, we really don't believe that's going to help learners. And that if, if, you, if you think of uh, uh, like electricity or water, water flowing through standardized pipes or electricity flowing in a partic particular alternating current, um, direct current model. Like there's a standard way of having that information flow so that different appliances in the system uh, can, can make the housework, the refrigerator, the washing machine, the lights. You might choose a different washing machine. You might choose a different set of lights, but that the, the flow of that current is consistent. So you don't have to rebuild the lamp every time you want to put a new lamp in the house. Um, so I think on that first, there's a tapestry. I think we actually have seen some K-12 school districts and some vendors at the far end of like really frictionless, completely interoperable, seamless pass through of information, including grades and other things that matter to, to related systems. And we've seen the opposite end of the spectrum as well. It's a tapestry where some vendors, while they may pledge or may, may intend to support um, this kind of model of, of electricity or flow of information sort of haven't yet understood the, the benefit to all, including themselves, of allowing for, let's say, one roster grade pass back happen seamlessly. Okay. Um, pause on that. And, Thanks, and David. To that, yep. Go ahead. I'll be very quick, Rob. Um, I promise. To that point, we have thousands of districts that adopted technology for the first time or for this first time in a meaningful way in the last year, or the last mm -hmm. 18 months. So I think to your tapestry point, we need to figure out how to bring those districts along in these conversations because they've never been in these conversations. And, and that's an impact waiting to happen. Thank you. One of the comments in the chat, we've only got a couple of minutes left, but was that perhaps organiza some organizations are trying to monetize the implementation of standards. Does anyone have a comment along those lines or, or want to bring that up or any other practices or things they might be seeing that could be improved or better or? So Rob, I'll be quick. I think we're in the third inning. We've had some strikeouts. We've had a couple of uh, singles, but nobody scored any real home runs yet, right? But secondly, mm -hmm. there are two groups I'm concerned about um, trying to sidestep the open standards movement. 
One is large companies that are heavily into mergers and acquisition and think that they can impose a proprietary system if they just procure enough other solutions. The other one is actually the venture capital community that is trying to show uh, innovation without interoperability. So mm -hmm. the, the first group is the mega existing providers. The last group are those trying to bring new ideas, but don't want to play nice with others because that's where they think their margin is going to be had. I see. So maybe we need to be more aware of the, uh, figuring those issues out. Emily, you might have the last word here. Oh, that'd be fantastic. So um, on the IMS Global website, uh, where the, you know, the pledge and uh, various districts were signing the pledge, the quote that I had there was something to the effect that this pledge, these standards position education organizations to leverage our collective voice to level the playing field so we can get the home run <laughs> when purchasing and implementing um, instructional tools. So we have to speak up and speak out against the the, the big guys, yep, that's exactly what they're doing, Dan. Um, and we have to work together for the cause. This is a cause. Okay. Well, thank you, panelists. Emily, that was a great way to end. Uh, I want to thank all the panelists. You've uh, really been uh, superheroes, uh, and, you, and I can attest to that you all really are doing this in the real world every day. And thank you to the viewers for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed. And, and uh uh, just wanted to note that the next session is uh, Gregory Fowler, who is the new uh, president of University of Maryland Global Campus. So you might want to tune into that one. That should be a great.